Interactivity is the one thing that makes games, games. I mean, you could have fantastic visuals, outstanding music, a killer world, but if I don't do anything in it, then you just made a movie, essentially. Interactivity brings games to life, but there are certain games that only work as games. You can tell a compelling story about Halo or The Last of Us or Uncharted without ever handing me a controller, in theory, but sometimes a game delivers on something only games can do. Putting me in the seat of the border officer in Papers, Please, witnessing the quantum moon of the Outer Wilds, or having to get up close and personal with Jeff in Half-Life Alex just doesn't carry the same emotional toil or tension if we watch a character do them on a screen. Us interacting with that world and existing within that space is what makes them as compelling as they are. It's the crux upon which some of the greatest games stand. It's the idea that the title justifies its own existence within the interactive medium and delivers a story that can't can't be done outside of playable spaces. Hypnospace Outlaw is an adventure game made by Jay Tholen released in 2019. Set in an alternate 1999 in which the future of computing today is sleep computing. Users of HypnoS put on headbands connected to their computers, and lasers in those headbands stimulate their brain, producing a vivid lucid dream of computer operation. Your actions are sent off to the servers, and that effectively makes productivity or connectedness a 24-7 ordeal, with the only roadblock being acquiring one of the $500 headbands and the cost of renting a page per month. You are not just a normal user, though. You are one of the enforcers, a group of moderators who ensure that HypnoSpace users abide by the CHIME laws, forbidding the depiction of copyrighted materials without permission, harassment, illegal activities, malicious software, or extra-legal commerce. Each violation carries with it violation points, and you can flag users if they have enough of them, which could result in a warning, their page getting temporarily delisted, or an outright ban from the service with enough of them. The game starts on November 5th, 1999, and your company Merchantsoft is hard at work on HypnoS 2000, the next generation software for the sleep time headbands. As in its current form, Hypnospace, the web zones provided within the operating system, are a bit of a mess. The service's power users are dissatisfied with Adrian Merchant's hands-off management paired with Dylan Merchant's excessive micromanagement and scattered brainedness. The two brothers have become big shot tech moguls by their early 20s, and their success has led to them getting complacent. Dylan is spending less time on hypnospace development as their rival program, Cyberworlds, is drawing the attention of gamers. Simply put, Cyberworlds has games. Hypnospace has a text adventure and a game about not doing drugs. Dylan wants to change this and offer a lot of new game experiences, as HypnoS 2000 will contain the game he's been working on for the past several months, Outlaw. But this means he's not spending time fixing bugs in the operating system or delegating work to the enforcers, leaving them swamped and understaffed, or at least overworked. The Merchant Brothers' mismanagement goes beyond not just prioritizing the right projects. The aesthetic movement of cool punk, combining corporate jingles and slowed down ambience, is co-opted by Merchant Soft and the cola company many of these songs use into a snow-themed, unironic, chintzy pop movement with all of the subtlety evaporated. And that gets its own zone on Hypnospace exclusively to advertise an upcoming festival meant to shill the soda and kick the proceeds back to the Merchant Brothers. Meanwhile, five words Worlds from before November, the Sci-Fi Starport, the Dream Castle, Gamers Only, the Cybercog Station, and the Comic Shop all get merged into one and dumped onto the slowest server Merchantsoft owns, leading to a hopelessly frustrating time for fans of five different nerdy hobbies who have their passions devalued by a company currently trying to make money on a botched, misappropriated underground music movement and adults that just don't know any better. Furthermore, users of Merchantsoft's Net Settler have had their pages corrupted when accessed in Hypnospace. They actually delisted most of them, but not all of them, and the only means to view the ones that remain is the professional version of Hypnocure, which is over seven times more expensive than the basic version. As an enforcer, you have an easy means of making Hypnocoin as you're paid for the rules you enforce in the cases you crack. 
but for regular users, their options seem a whole lot more limited, and a lot of them are technically not allowed on Hypnospace, such as Janitor. So this is where you come in. You're given cases and you have to crack down on the broken rules in order to get paid, and then you spend those coins on the world of Hypnospace as you work on your next cases. While the earliest case is as simple as can be, just find illegal depictions of the 1962 cartoon character Gumshoe Gooper, later cases require a lot more digging around. For instance, you have to look into harassment going on in Teen Topia early on, but when you go to their front-facing pages, the only sign of actual harassment is a few kids with a Zane Sucks banner on their page, but nothing particularly inflammatory from Zane himself. That's because the page that made the other kids mad is hidden, and requires you to browse his page's tags to find the site of The Dumpster, a satirical critic that collects the worst of Hypnospace. And even though he doesn't feature the work of children, he had to make an exception for Zane's very crude and disgusting depiction of Cory, which is what made the other teens get pissed off at Zane. As the game progresses, you will spend less and less time on those front-facing pages in Hypnospace and more time looking into the histories of others, checking their tags or searching their username in the search tool to see what all they've gotten up to, and find what they're hiding from the enforcers. One of the tools used to carry on unwanted conduct is Flist, a file sharing service that's stored as a hidden page connected to your user ID. In order to sign up for Flist, you have to be invited, and enforcers cannot communicate with the outside world. So for you, that means you have to do some digging. A page of tech tips suggests using personal info to create passwords. And you can use these tips to get access to Flist, using one of many passwords from people taking advice from this page. You might find encrypted files, and later on in the game, it's revealed that to crack this food-themed encryption, you just need to feed it to a virtual pet will eat around the file, leaving it ready for your use. In this regard, Hypnospace Outlaw is a point and click, but instead of your standard verbs and character actions, you're clicking open links and running programs in a virtual operating system, which I just think is really neat. The actual toolset in Hypnospace Outlaw is incredibly nuanced and isn't immediately accessible. Solving puzzles to gather these pieces or just digging around on web pages for hints and clues is incredibly satisfying and incredibly nostalgic all the same. The Hypnospace of 1999 is a lot like our internet of 1999, compressed image and video quality, shitty templates, and bad grammar to boot. As you play the game over three time periods between November 99 and January 2000, many of Hypnospace's pages change and new ones open up. Some old ones also close down too, and not all of them are full of deeply vital hints or broken rules. Many pages are just here to help enrich the world. Comics, music, game reviews, blogs, and even malware are scattered around Hypnospace's various zones, and so much of it is up to you to download and acquire. Stickers to decorate your desktop, new themes, backgrounds, and screensavers, music to listen to, applications to run, there's a very wide variety of things to look at and do in Hypnospace. And while the game can be beaten rather quickly if you know where to go, Sometimes it pays to just look around and experience the cluttered chaos of the early web as we knew it. But with that said, your own cyber sleuthing can help you skip puzzles altogether if you know what you're doing. In one mission, the player is meant to install the Bonzi Buddy-inspired Professor Helper, who clouds your desktop with intrusive pop-up ads. However, on those ads, players will notice that they're hosted on Professor Helper's Hypnospace page. If you know that, you can simply punch in the professor's username to find his ad directory and take those pages down without needing to download the obnoxious software. If the player figures out how to access Flist early, in many cases entire puzzles can be completely skipped by just accessing a user's database and hitting the proper files for the relevant crime. This makes an otherwise very linear game a whole lot more open. There are a lot of ways to solve the puzzles, from the intended slow and scenic route to brute forcing your way through, with all the tools your job entails. Perhaps Hypnospace Outlaw's most compelling aspect is its characters. Most of them are barely teens, using the internet gleefully and cringefully, with no regard for a coherent brand or social presence. Others are typically older adults doing honestly very much the same. Carl P's website blares loud music and is packed with gifts of skeletons on motorcycles, but also contains a eulogy for his wife right there on that same page. Zane's girlfriend has a page all about how nice Zane is, but her headband ID is the same as Zane's, implying she's not even real. 
After having Gumshoe Gooper taken down, many members of Good Time Valley assume this is because his creator was a staunch anti-communist, and the zone rallies behind the fish in a coat with artwork of him carrying American flags and rifles, without actually considering that copyright law is to blame for the character's removal. Many of the older users are fooled by the Beef Brain hoax, which mentions that the only way to save someone from infection is to cover their website in intrusive sidebars, so you'll find them all over Hypnospace. Some users take their sidebars down, others don't. Investigating music piracy on Hypnospace leads you to the page of DM Noise Pusher, whose real name is listed in the investigation tool, is Dylan Merchant, your boss. Steve Guy has his net settler page destroyed and creates an account in Hypnospace to express dissatisfaction that his regular page does not work correctly, and other net settler users get behind him for this. Gil Sanders of Starport Castle Dream Station founds an independent zone within that zone called the Freelands, which takes the form of a top-down map of a fantasy world. But his dominating personality means he micromanages the entire zone, forcing people to conform to his idea of what it should look like and issuing citations and takedowns when people don't comply. Leaving the Freelands not really free, and as just as sorry of a state as the rest of Hypnospace. Every corner of this game is packed with interesting people whose lives change a step at a time over the course of the month you're working with Merchant Soft. Even just exploring the extraneous websites is a lot of fun. Reading The Observer and learning about the latest video games with End This Game's World, checking in on what this whole granny cream business is all about, going to a page that's clearly made by a kid with an overzealous dinosaur fascination, and checking in on the very eccentric webpage Tim has designed, which constantly scrolls to produce an animation of sorts. Actually, in that regard, Hypnospace is shockingly faithful to the amounts of weird and fun stuff we did with HTML back in the day. Sending the scroll bar lower and lower, making marquees of scrolling text, changing the color of a paragraph element to get the user's attention. The works. Yes, while most of the game is just… reading, emulating so many nuances of the old internet leads to a game that could not work in any other context. It's a point and click, sure, but you're pointing and clicking on files. Your tools or applications on your hotbar or in a browser's toolbar. Even the loading times are a major part of the game's design. The Freelands, that user-created alternative to Starport Castle Dream Station, is still housed on the slowest server Merchant Soft owns, but it uses an excessive number of art assets, so it takes several seconds to load. But wiggling your mouse around makes things load or process faster in the entire game. This is a nod to a weird idiosyncrasy with Windows 95 that made the process stack work faster when you shook the cursor around, and also a nod to people just being impatient. And it's just really weird and really, really cool. One of the Freelands users, Ringleader Roddy, creates a program that boosts download times by effectively overloading the server, and one of your cases is to track it down and hit it with a violation. The Freelands is also partially home to Minx, a hacker group that hides away from enforcers through the use of Second Sight, using a program called the All Seeing Eye, which is locked away behind sandwich encryption. Here, you get access to a number of debug tools, if you so choose, and Second Sight is also required to track down usernames and passwords to get into Minx's portal as well, where you learn that many of the oddities throughout Hypnospace were hoaxes. Beef Brain was a joke, Counselor Ronnie and his awful raps that won Hypnospace ed educational grants were a prank. The Eye of Horus that keeps popping up everywhere was all just a contest to hide the thing as best as they could. And also, nobody likes Dylan. Come New Year's Eve, Hypnospace gets the Year 2000 update, which is notably buggy, full of lag spikes and with essentially nothing new. Teentopia also gets hit with a scare, the Y2K mind crash. Only one person can stop it, the mother of the son of Tim. <sighs> okay, so Tim has a crush on Tiff, and she hates when he calls her Marshmallow with an E, so if we just, yep, okay. Minecrash is a hoax as well, trying to make her the hero of Hypnospace to win her over, but yeah, no, this is just shitty. She doesn't want to be a part of this, and you're just dragging her into this, and she doesn't want that. You're an asshole, Tim. Oh, and what would the year 2000 update for Hypnospace be without a new version of Outlaw? Okay, yeah, fuck Merchant Soft. Dylan is not a good programmer. 
His newest rushed version of Outlaw, paired with a poorly tested and rushed version of Hypnospace, just crashed the headbands of everyone online when it happened, and killed anywhere from four to six people. Of course, this came minutes after Mine Crash ended, so Dylan has Tim take the blame and the Merchant Brothers hide away any evidence of wrongdoing. I mean, it's not like sleep time computing was gonna last, as after the Beef Brain rumors, they conducted an independent study into the headbands. And it really fucks up your ability to sleep. You don't get a lick of good rest when you're online, and the end of the game becomes proving both of these points and then watching Dylan accept responsibility for the actions he caused years ago. You're also sent on a mission to archive all of Hypnospace, as it's been over 20 years and at this point, most of what's here has become lost media. The headbands were recalled, and all that remains is a few select people tracking down all the sites so they can have them ripped from the hard drives and stored somewhere else. The game takes on an eerily nostalgic atmosphere as you jump between time periods to look at how everything changed, and as you explore around looking for files requested by the Archive's admins, what once was a story about striking down cartoon fish in a hat is now about exploring these lost ruins, looking back at teens being teens, reckless, impulsive, and willing to push their digital playground to its absolute limit. Looking back at just how far we've come in 20 years, just how bad everything has gotten, but knowing that to some respect, things can get better. An underground artist on Hypnospace is now a highly successful producer. Dylan Merchant, after losing a deal with Grey's Peak Cola, destroying several thousand headbands, and watching his life's work get federally recalled, but escaping with a scapegoat, taking the blame, has become a big shot tech mogul yet again, it seems, accessing Hypnomail with his D phone. Tamara, a spoken word poet back in the 90s, is now an established children's author. Likewise, the trolls and inflammatory folk from internet days gone by now have an opportunity to grow and change, and while it's cringeworthy to look back on our old works, sometimes it's all just a sign of where we all started, a reminder that we've been pushing forward over the years. Hypnospace Outlaw is fundamentally the platonic ideal of an adventure game. It's not abstract clicking and verb usage. You're browsing a fake internet, looking for clues, reading about the latest trends, pirating music, and infecting your computer with suspicious software on sheer accident. Just like using a real computer. Hopefully you're not downloading malware on your real computer. Characters you meet put on outward-facing personas, but might hide darker beliefs behind their back, if you know where to look. Shady bosses want to be treated as being above the law and will take power from you if you abuse it, which is to say, if you use it as intended. And while you could tell the stories of these characters in a book or a film, the amount of intimacy, the amount of genuine raw emotion on display here could only be done in a game, with the player fully interacting with the pages, scrolling through them and checking out profiles, and taking in the 90s internet cheese. In an age where we seem stuck in an unflinching present day, where films from nearly two decades ago still look good today, where the 13-year-old Bioshock barely needs a polish but the 13-year-older Mario 64 has aged like a fine milk, where a technology just keeps getting thinner with narrower bezels, an era of so much unrestricted creativity, aesthetics be damned, feels so foreign. It's easy to scoff at it all, rich and grown that it's not pretty by modern standards but it's still imperative to treasure these times, an age of an ever-changing wild west of artistic design, where we got to have our own small part of the World Wide Web to call home. And Hypnospace Outlaw is a touching love letter to that era, all the same. This game is lovely, and I, I do recommend it, even if you sat through all of the spoilers here or watched somebody else play it. I watched somebody else complete the game, and then I played it twice more because I love this thing dearly. And if you liked this video, hey, why not consider subscribing? You can also check out my coffee link in the description and help support me financially. Oh, and check out jruddick.neocities.org. I think you might like it. Hypnospace Outlaw is available on PC, Nintendo Switch, PlayStation 4, and Xbox One for 20 bucks. A typical playthrough will take about four hours, but it's well worth the money. A sequel of sorts by the name of Dream Settler is also coming soon, and I'm really looking forward to that.